you very much. Can I ask if there's any um, GPs in the audience? Oh, that's good. It's more than I thought it would be. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Um, I'd also like to mention Jude Hayward, who's a G GP up in Bradford. Jude's um, one of the few GPs who works actively in genetics. She works for the Yorkshire and Humber uh, Regional Genetics Centre as a clinical assistant. And she and I were both GPs with a specialist interest in genetics back in 2005 when the Department of Health set up some money to fund GPs. At that time, they funded 10 GPs, um, and the main roles were around sort of education and, and, um, and highlighting genetics relevant to primary care. And I think that's the challenge really for us. Um, there's a real drive at the moment to mainstream genetics into, into everyday clinical practice. Um, and the challenge really for us in primary care is to help to facilitate the adoption and diffusion of the new knowledge um, to make sure that we're keeping up with our education and training requirements um, but also to think about new models of care, new ways of working um, particularly in, in the way that we currently work at the moment. So my talk is really going to be a, a mixture of all these three things. Um, perhaps a good place to start is to think about how general practice might look um, in the future. And the RCGP produced this document called 2022, which was um, very much um, trying to anticipate what the challenges were for general practice. And those challenges are really the, the, the challenges that we face at the moment, um, which is dealing with, dealing with patients who have multimorbidity. So these are patients with more than one, one long-term complex medical condition. And the, if, you, if we're thinking about it from a genetics and genomics perspective, um, the complexity of information that we're gonna get from, from genetic information applied to our patients is going to be quite complex and having to deal with that both as a professional but also from a patient perspective I think could be quite challenging. The, the other um, aspects really is, is dealing with an aging population but also the, the mix of the population as well. So we're going to be dealing um, with different ethnic populations, different um, patients who are at risk of, for example, founder mutations. You know, these are mutations that have um, stayed with that particular population for a long time. And so, for example, um, the Ashkenazi Jewish population who are particularly at, at increased risk of the BRCA genes. Um, and then making sure that we address health inequalities. Uh, we know that patients from black ethnic uh, minority groups don't really engage with genetic services. Um, and as, as the advantages of genetic knowledge is, is implemented in primary care, uh, we need to help to, to redress that. Um, and then the other really important aspect really is about um, promoting patient engagement, patient self-management, um, patient activation. And um, I'll give an example at the end uh, that might be pertinent to today's discussion. So this is Jude's office um, in Bradford, and um, although she's not sitting there, her presence is there. And the other thing that really dominates this room is the computer. Um, I did a degree in computing before I did medicine. At medical school, um, they, they asked me why I wanted to become a doctor. And I said, it's because I didn't want to sit in front of a computer for 12 hours a day. And, and, and you know, we're just completely dominated by this, you know, without, you know, let alone having to deal with the patient. But actually, we can use the computer to our advantage in, in dealing with genetic information and, and um, genetic knowledge. To be a GP now, um, you have to um, qualify through specialty training and take the MRCGP at the end of your training. Um, so the curriculum is broad, but within it, there is a chapter on genetics. And it talks very much about um, common genetic conditions like hereditary hemochromatosis, like polycystic kidney disease, like the hemoglobinopathies that we may face on a day-to-day -day basis. And once you start to list these conditions, you begin to realise that actually genetics is relevant to day-to-day -to -day general practice. It, it extols the importance of family history and family history taking. Um, deals with the attitudinal and holistic care aspects of genetics um, and particularly the societal impact of genetics but also um, emphasises the, the importance of being aware of, about the impact of new technology on day-to-day on -day practice. The difficulty with this is that um, the trainers in general practice 
I don't think really have got um, a lot of confidence in that they can pass on um, genetic knowledge to their trainees. So, so there is a gap. And I don't know if any of you are, are trainers. Um, um, no, okay. So what we deal with in primary care is, is a lot of multifactorial conditions. So these are conditions where there's this interplay between genetics and environment. Um, but what we heard from Peter was that uh, we're increasingly finding out information about genomic variation uh, around, you know, the, the pre presumed, you know, multifactorial type of conditions. So, so the classification of diseases is going to change, and, and we're going to need to to keep up with that. Why is that relevant? Well, consider this patient, um, a 42 year old man who has relatively recently been diagnosed with diabetes and he behaved um, as if he was insulin dependent. But actually, when it was found that his control wasn't particularly good with insulin, he was changed onto sulfonylureas, and in fact, um, his control was a lot better. And there are um, these genomic variations of diabetes, and MODI, maturity onset of diabetes of the young, is such an example where the treatment actually <coughs> Um, is quite different once you understand um, the, the etiology of the disease. So, and MODI itself is not just one single disease. Um, you can classify it based on genetic variation. Um, and, and so the question is, you know, what testing does it need? Um, does, does the screening change in terms of potential complications that he might suffer? Um, what difference do comorbidities make to his condition? And so on. So one particular example of a, of a sort of a genetic disease you know, that, that we may be faced with in primary care. We're also going to be faced, I think, with new pathways of care, and we heard that through this personalised medicine conference that has been going on for the last two days. Um, and these are pathways of care where um, genomic testing um, is incorporated in, in um, the referral process or in the pathway process. And we also heard earlier about inherited cardio cardiac diseases. And here's an example of a 31-year-old woman who is known to have long QT syndrome. And um, a genetic mutation has been identified. And this becomes the marker for the rest of the family um, who you know, would then presumably want genetic testing and, and appropriate surveillance. And then an awareness of new technologies is, is again important. And here's an example where this is a relatively new cell-free fetal DNA. So in each pregnancy, there's um, a certain amount of cell-free fetal DNA that circulates in the maternal blood. And that fetal DNA is specific to that pregnancy. Uh, and the amount does slightly increase um, as the gestation increases as well. And there's been a lot of work around this, um, and in particular, it, it's now being used through the NHS to identify women um, who may not need anti-D, um, because you can um, look at the fetal DNA and work out the rhesus status of the fetus. Um, and that's particularly important, in, for example, with the hematic disease of the newborn type of families. Um, the, the technology around this is also going to help, particularly with, for example, screening for excellent conditions, um, but also for um, Down syndrome as well. Um, so I think it's going to be really important. Um, but it also throws up some ethical dilemmas as well, because a simple blood test to tell you that you know, there, there may be a Down syndrome um, baby being carried um, still necessitates the, the discussions around the test, pretest counselling and so on. One of the um, important things that we do in primary care is risk stratification. Um, here's an example of a risk stratification tool that we use in primary care. And this is um, based on Q-Risk, which is working out cardiovascular um, risk for, for an individual. And the risk, the, ultimate, the final risk comes back to to you as a percentage risk. And it's based on various parameters, which includes family history. Um, and again, you know, we know that family history is a powerful um, marker of potential um, you know, morbidity. So um, here's a tool that we can use that, that can help us. 
And I think in the future, what we're going to need is, is future tools that are embedded within our IT systems that can help us work out and use the genetic information that's coming through for particular conditions, particularly applied to, for example, complex conditions or, or motor mobility conditions. Um, and so the story of genetic information and how it's applied in general practice is going to be quite an important thing to address, I think, in the future. But an important way to, to re-stratify um, patients who are worried about their, their family history is to take a good family history. Um, and there are guidelines available, so in this case, um, we're talking about familial breast cancer, and, and there are nice guidelines around this, which, which help us stratify our patients into high, uh, moderate, or low risk. Um, and clearly, you, you imagine that this is quite a high risk family, so here we have a 30-year-old woman right down at the bottom who's worried about her family history. Her father had prostate cancer at 48. Paternal aunt died of a very cancer at 52. Paternal um, um, uncle had breast cancer at 61. So this is a man breast cancer. Um, and then there's also a paternal grandfather who had pancreatic cancer. So, so what alerts us to, to genetic um, potential genetic families. Well here in this case it's having multiple cancers, it's having cancers that are associated with each other, so breast and ovarian cancer, it's cancers which occur at a young age, um, but also atypical cancers in the wrong sex, so as breast cancer of a man is clearly quite a significant um, um, diagnosis. Um, and so it's sort of recognising these families, being alert to them, um, and then knowing uh, correct pathways, referral pathways, um, you know, to, to help these families. So I, mentioned, I think I've mentioned a little bit about information comments already, but um, this is going to be really important for us as well. So how we share information, how it's recorded on our genetic <coughs> systems um, is going to be important, particularly if there is shared records um, between primary and secondary care. Um, and then how we also use our IT systems for surveillance as well. So there are going to be chronic uh, long-term genetic conditions in which we're going to be responsible really for, for ensuring that patients are monitored for potential complications. And so in this case, for example, we may well have patients with myotonic dystrophy uh, who we know are at risk of diabetes each year. And so they may well need to have a, you know, they should be having regular monitoring um, and that is likely to need to be done in general practice. So it's having an awareness about these genetic conditions, but also having the appropriate surveillance in place to, to ensure that the testing is done. And then the other aspect of this is, is about service delivery. Um, it's clear at the moment um, that the current methods, of, you know, the traditional methods that we need to ensure to consult um, are probably going to need to change. You know, 10 minutes for an average consultation um, for many patients isn't enough. Um, and also, does it need to be face to face? Um, so, there have been many sort of models of pilot models looking out there, looking at how to implement new types of service deliveries. And this includes, for example, telemedicine and, and so on. Um, there has been some work done about um, providing um, gen counsellors in primary care and um, based in the community. And, and there have been sort of one of the randomised control trials that have looked at um, how effective this has been. Um, recently, there was a, a meeting um, looking at how clinical geneticists in the future could, could change um, the way they work to assist in mainstream genetics in the NHS. Um, and clearly, they're going to need to provide expertise in clinical management of, of patients with, with complex conditions. Um, they are the strong genetic component. Um, but the way that they can help us in primary care, I think, may well need to change. And in particular, delivering a service that's flexible, you know, that's local, that's easily accessible. Um, for example, e-consultating may be maybe one way in which they may well be able to assist. Finally, um, we talked a lot about um, chronic conditions and people who are unwell, but um, facilities now available for those who, who are well but are worried about their, their genetic risk. Um, and these are people who may want to go through genetic 
red card and all that, that's now available to them. So there are potential benefits or potential cons of this, and enough for the foundation back in 2010 wrote quite a good um, article about this. And if we were talking right at the beginning about patient self-management and patient autonomy, patient empowerment, then genetic profiling offers the patient um, the ability to take more personal control over their health. Um, and it may also help them in terms of alerting both them and their relatives about um, some important genetic conditions. The worry you, you have about this really is that um, understanding the test results firstly is going to be quite a challenge for, for some, um, particularly if you don't know how the tests actually originate and what their analytical validity is, what their clinical validity is, what the clinical utility of the test is, as well as all the ethical and legal and social aspects of the test as well. Um, being, being told that your genetic, that you're not at an increased genetic risk may actually lead to changing behaviour as well. Um, and whereas before, if you thought you had family history that told you um, you might be at risk of, of diabetes and then you did a genetic test that said otherwise, that may, may, may lead to a change in behaviour, even though family history actually is going to be really quite important to pay attention to. Um, and then there is the potential for misuse of genetic information as well. Um, and, and so, for example, um, how, how that's used and, and applied by insurance companies, I think it's going to be interesting and, and challenging for the future as well. Um, the other part of it is also the healthcare utilisation of um, people who undergo these tests. And then the worry and concern that they might have, um, the lack of understanding over the test, which may then need um, an onward referral to, to a specialist. So, so there are going to be needs um, for, for evaluating this as well.